El Roy, or uh, I actually looked it up, and it's El Roy. Uh, yeah, I you know I went ahead and looked at the pronunciation, but you know God God sees our hearts, and we know He knows us even when we pronounce things incorrectly according to uh, whoever you know. And so God God who sees. Um, we're looking at the names of God as they come up new and fresh, um, and they constantly do that in the book of Genesis. So we have these new, fresh names of God, many of which are then used throughout the Old Testament after that. So we're highlighting those as we come across them. And that's the connection between the Old Testament and the new this year is God who sees. We have God who sees in the Old Testament, God sees Hagar in her suffering. God sees her as she's run away. She's, she's from Egypt, and so she has headed back to Egypt, and along the way, in the wilderness, come to a spring. And God sees her there and sends an angel to her. And he sees her heart. He sees her suffering. He sees her need to be comforted and her need to be assured. God who sees. Then, in our gospel passage in Luke, Jesus sees. He sees the hearts. He sees the hearts of this gang of people, friends or family, that decided we are going to take this friend of ours, this loved one who cannot walk, we are going to put him on a mat and we are going to get him in front of Jesus. He, he sees the faith of that, that group. And he sees the faith of the man himself. You got to think, okay, he can go along with getting carted over to Jesus. But then when they start saying about, let's go up on the roof. Think, <laughs> think about his faith at that point. Like, uh, the roof, guys, you, wanna put, you, you got me on a mat. I can't walk, and now you're talking about the roof. And so Jesus sa it says Jesus saw, this is right from the text, Jesus saw their faith. He saw the faith of the people that loved someone that much as to, to physically carry him before Jesus for healing. And then he saw the faith of that man willing to take the risk. Okay, let's go up on the roof. I believe, this, this, I believe that God is with this man and he can heal me. And then, so Jesus also sees the hearts of the Pharisees who don't have faith. So, El Roy, El Roy, God sees us. God can see into our hearts. So the Genesis passage... The context is, um, right before this, there was when the, the name Adonai came out, when Abram was petitioning God and uses the name Adonai out of respect. It's, it's a Lord, master word. And so it says, Yahweh Adonai, Lord, 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 master, Lord God. And so he says that to him and says, why don't I have any descendants? You're making me all these promises. But... You're, you're, you're not fulfilling your promise. My, my inheritance, everything is going to go on to this man from Damascus who's my steward who isn't really part of this. And so I, I don't get it. And so he petitioned God. And then that's when God took him out under the stars on that beautiful night with all those stars and said, count them, Abram, count the stars. That's how many descendants you will have, uncountable and then, even after that promise to assure Abram's faith, then he cuts an official covenant with him. God meets him where he is. And at that time, without contracts and such, it was one of the ways to make a covenant was, to, was with animals. And you walk through the middle of the animals. Well, God did that. So here, Abram has had God promise him through this abundance of the stars, cut an official covenant that was being done at that time just to show him, I'm serious about this, this promise, Abraham. Abram, you can trust me. 
And so then we have this failure. And, and this, is, this is complete and utter failure. Uh, this is lack of faith. This is taking things into our own hands. And what you see is a human plan. And what you see is calamity. You see, uh, this, again, this is almost like the reverse of the last time they failed in their faith. You remember there was a famine and not waiting for God who can provide no matter what, they went down to Egypt. And even on the way, Abram knew there would be trouble. So on the way, he says, hey, Sarai, why don't you, let's say you're my sister so I don't get hassled too much. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and, and in the same way, it's like in the opposite, he puts his bride the love of his life, the provision of God into the hands of another. He says, this is, my, this is my sister. Sure, Pharaoh can marry her. What a lack of faith to even go down to Egypt in the first place without God's word and then to allow that to happen, to not rely on God's provision, to not rely on God's protection. Abram. So there's a failure, but this is kind of the reverse. You see, she now puts him in the arms of another. She says, you know, God's not coming through. There's, it's been some time since these promises, Abram. So, you know, there's Hagar. Why don't you take her and, and Ab Abraham unwisely? Uh, this is one occasion, probably the only one, where you don't do what your wife says. This is, we, we can document this. This is the... <laughs> This is the exception, okay? If I find another exception, I'll let you know. But we'll go ahead and mark it down right now as the one. Here's the one. You don't, <laughs> you don't do that. Uh, God has provided for you. This is the one for you. He has promised. Wait patiently. And so, that you know, even if it's God's end, you know, they, you could say, well, they were trying to do, they were trying to get there. They were trying to meet what God wanted at the end, right? To have all these descendants. They wanted that, but they did it their own way. They did it their human way. And what you see is a complete soap opera disaster. You see the two women, you see them as one gets pregnant and the other isn't. You see rivalry, jealousy, hate. Then Sarai turns on Abraham and says, it's your fault, may, may Yahweh judge you, she says. So now you see blame and judgment. And then, then Sarai becomes abusive. So you see abuse and then the breaking of the relationship. You see she has to run away. And so it, just, just absolute disaster because God is the ends and the means, right? If, if, if we have, if, we've, if God's given us a vision and said, and a promise and said, this is what I'm going to do for you, we do not, through our own means, try to get there because it will be a disaster. God wants to be part of the whole thing, the small steps, the big steps, the whole thing. We have to trust him. The first point, patiently, faithfully wait for the Lord to unfold his plan. I read a good quote from, from Emerson uh, this week. Um, Adopt the pace of nature. Her secret is patience. Isn't that wonderful? God has promised us he is going to protect and provide for us. He has plans for us, plans to prosper you, plans to give you a future, a hope and a future. Do not take the soap opera route and make up your own means of getting there. Patiently, patiently wait for God to unfold his plans. This, this is a lesson we all need over and over. And so God comes to the rescue as he does time and time again in the Bible and in Genesis. God sends an angel to Hagar. God sees her, sees her in her suffering, 
sends an angel to the spring in the wilderness where she is. Here we have, here we have a, another single mom marginalized by people in their selfish, stupid plans. And he sees the suffering. Our God is the God of those who are oppressed and suffering. And so he comes to her. The angel comes to her. And he says to her, he gives her the assurance she needs. He says to her, you and your baby will be fine. You will, you will bear this baby. You will not die in the wilderness, going back to Egypt, trying to start over. You will not be abused along the road. You will not be abused anymore. I will protect you. Go back, and I will protect you. Come back. Come back under my fold. This is, this is the second point. Return to humble service. And then he promises her. He says, you, you're going to be fine. The baby's going to be fine. In fact, I'm going to bless. This, this, you're going to have so many descendants. A, a very similar promise that he gave to Abraham. You will have, you have descendants uncountable. And so uh, he makes that promise to her. He, res he assures her. And so she returns. And now, it doesn't say this, but we understand this from the context. And what happens is Abraham and Sarai, Abram and Sarai, learn the lesson too. Because she returns and tells them this story, and they believe her. Why? What evidence do we have? Well, first, they don't kick her out again, at least not for a while. They, d they accept her back, and then Abram, who has authority to name the child, names the child Ishmael. Where did he get that name? She came back and told them the story. I was running away. I was at a spring. An angel appeared to me and gave me these promises. And Abram's listening, and he's like, that checks out. That's happened to me before. That's, that's how God works. He assured you, and he gave you promises. And, and, that, and, and the, the uncountable descendants, I've heard that before. That's the way God works. And so they believed her. An Egyptian maidservant, they believed her. And then he, he did exactly as told by the, by the angel. He named the child Ishmael. She accepted, she, Sarai, accepted that Hagar has been instructed by the angel of the Lord to return and to submit to service. So in essence, they learn the lesson and they submit to service as well. And this is, this is, the, this is what we need to do. Of course, we're going we're gonna to make these mistakes. Of course, we're going to make the mistake of, not, of being impatient, not listening to God, getting anxious, maybe getting a little desperate, and taking things into our own hands. And then God's going to remind us and at that, what to do then, if you make the mistake of being impatient, is, re is return to humble service in the Lord because he forgives us and loves us. So the Luke story. Now what's, what's the context, the setting here is Jesus has established his ministry in Galilee. He's, he's been moving around Galilee and he's healing and he's teaching and people have taken note. And so he's established. And so what Luke does is for the first time, and this happens in all the Gospels, but for the first time in Luke, the conflict appears between the human religious authorities and Jesus. So it's the first time Luke is, is bringing it in right here. And it's Luke, uh, in particular in the text, brings it out by saying, and the power of the Lord was on Jesus to heal people. Now he doesn't, obviously he's already talked about healings. He doesn't need to say that. He's saying that to show, and the power of the Lord, to make sure you, we know, setting up this contrast, the power of the Lord is with Jesus. And then he says, then the Pharisees and scribes have come from Galilee, Judea, 
and even Jerusalem. And so now he's saying, this is authority. This is a big deal. These guys, these guys are, they're probably wearing it, you know? <laughs> like, they, they, these guys walk into town and, and everybody's like, whoa, you know, the top dogs are here. The Jerusalem Pharisees, they're wearing it. <laughs> so, you know, the, he, here's, here's the conflict. Luke is setting it up perfectly. You've got the authority of God and you've got human authority. And then there they are sitting there and you're just, you know, it's, it's waiting for it. It's, it, it the, the tension is thick. And so what happens? A guy, a guy comes in from the ceiling. And a uh, couple, couple points on Luke. First of all, I like that in Luke, they remove the tiles of the ceiling because in Mark, they're digging through. And for me, I'm always like, that's so dirty. Like Jesus would be like, what are you doing? You're making a mess. Look at all the dirt down here. So I like the idea of removing the tiles. That's a little cleaner. That's, that's helpful for me. I don't like the, the digging through idea. Removing the tiles, then they can be moved back nicely and everything could be fine. You know, you dig through, it's like, who's going to fix the roof now? Jesus, come on. Go ahead. <laughs> so I like the tiles. And then the other thing is, and it's, it's really a nice balance um, to the other point that we saw in, um, in the Hagar and Sarai story where they made the mistake of taking things into their own hands and not trusting God in, the, in, in every single step of the pilgrimage of faith. Um, we see that and we get that lesson, but then we have this nice balance where Jesus affirms the ingenuity of humanity, right? Jesus is like, cool idea. Like, I like that. You know, so, so there's a balance there. We're not to plan and, and make our own you know, go, go, go with our own plan on everything. We need to trust God. But God certainly loves our creativity and ingenuity along the way. And so here he comes through the roof, and Jesus just loves it. And he sees their hearts. And he says, he says, friends, your sins, your friend, your sins are forgiven. He saw their faith. And then he says, friend to the man, your sins are forgiven. And so there it is. There's, there's the conflict. There's the moment. Because as the, the fancy pants uh, Pharisees and scribes, they correctly notice that, well, he's forgiving sins now? You know, they can't, they can't debate the fact that he's healing people. It's obvious. It's physical. It's real. I mean, you know, it, it, everybody around there is like, no, this, this guy hasn't been able to walk, and he's walking now, you know. So they can't debate that. But that internal forgiveness, you know, we don't necessarily see that as much on the outside. So, so they're, they're attacking that. And they're, they're rightly noticing that this is, he is really taking authority. If he's saying, your sins are forgiven, only God can do that. And so Jesus sees their hearts. And he sees their lack of faith in him. Jesus sees. And it's, it's a judgment of Jesus. You know, if, you, if you've ever been judged, Jesus knows. He's, he, they're, they're, looking, they're looking at Jesus with human eyes. Who is, you know, can anything good come out of Nazareth? This is not, he, he didn't go to the same school as we did. He didn't, he didn't go to Harvard. <laughs> he, right. He didn't go to, you, have you met some Harvard people yet, Marina? Yes. She's in Boston in school. So, you know, um, and I'm sure there's some wonderful people there. And, and, uh, but it's, it's judging from, from the, the outside. Okay, so this week, um, the Grateful Dead were in town. So, you know, I was, I was, almost excited as the yada yada reunion uh, today. And um, there's been, uh, and you're judging me right now. <laughs> and uh, well, there's been these, Jerry Garcia was the leader and he died in 1995. Um, I got to see them right that same year in 1995. And, uh, and it 
just I what they call in the dead community, you fell in. You fell in. <laughs> you just like I just the music was so good, I fell in. I you know, or Jerry said it's like stepping in dog poop. It, it's not coming off very easily, you know. It's like you just kind of it in any type of really complicated um, it, music like that or something that's an acquired taste. Uh, you've got to kind of fall into it, and and I understand it. Just it it happened to me. So anyway, um, they've tried to put the band back together for years without any real long-term success until um, John Mayer fell in. John Mayer, the the pop star. Uh, fell in, and he is now in Jerry's spot um, playing lead guitar and singing. And so they've been touring for a little while, and I've been watching and waiting for them to come, and then, sure enough, they come right to downtown Orlando, right, in, right into my backyard. And um, we were on our way to the concert, driving, we're like, are the crazies, you know, <laughs> are the crazies going to be there? And then we pull into the parking lot, and the answer was yes. And so we, the carnival, and we, we go in there and we park, and the guy next to us has this beat up old truck. He's got dreadlocks down, ripped up shirt, and he's got a bunch of coconuts, and he's, he's selling coconuts, and he's cutting them with a machete, just like, just like they do in Guatemala. Except in Guatemala, they give you a straw. He didn't even have straws. He's like, no, I just drink it like. <laughs> so we're walking around, and I got my coconut. And um, we're observing the, we're observing the craziness and, and the carnival of it. And um, that's never been my attraction. My, I'm, it, it's purely musical for me. The, the extracurriculars is just kind of a, uh, and But you, you can't help it. And then you see people like, these are tramps, man. I mean, they're, some people are raising kids. You see their kids are there. And they're, you know, and they got the cars and they're, they're doing it. They're still living that, you know, if, if you think there aren't any hippies around, they're still around. They're there. And so you, you just can't help it thinking, well, these people are weird and crazy. And, what, you know, you, you have those judgments. It makes you feel a little uncomfortable. Like, what, what am I taking part in? So then we go and find our seats, and we sit down next to a couple who is in their 70s. And they remember going to dead shows in the 70s. And uh, they were wonderful. And we talked to them and we heard some stories and they shared their binoculars with us. In front of us were five girls covered in glitter and they were like probably 18, 19 years old. And they, they were bringing the energy. And uh, you see like how multi-generational this is. And then there, was, there, there were some people, and there's, there's some morons, just like any crowd of people. Um, and then next to us, there's this hippie lady and. Murray fell asleep during Drums in Space. It's a long concert. And she comes over and um, sprays some peppermint you know, oil spray to help wake Murray up. And so you just saw this, um, you know, what you want to judge these people, and then you see kindness. You, you, you know, what you, what you experience then is kindness, and it kind of uh, really kind of sets you in your place. Uh, it sets, you know, uh, why am I judging people from the outside? You know, let, let's let their hearts shine through and the kindness shine through. And, and that is the dead community in, in its I, most idealist, idealistic. Uh, there's a lyric, um, uh ho, what I want to know is, are you kind? So that's really the, the, the essence of what they're, they're trying to go. As opposed to last night, uh, Noah and I went to the, the soccer game and everyone looked normal, although they were dressed in purple. Um, and it, the game, sometimes the game just doesn't go well. And we, we gave up a penalty kick and got a red card very early. And people around us, the, and it was the first game, and so everyone was excited and probably tailgating for too long. And um, the place was overcome with anger. And Noah looked at me in, in language, and people were... Noah looked at me with tears in his eyes and said, Daddy, I want to go home. Yeah, so I took him home. And not that I st still love Orlando City. You know, they were just, I said, they'll, they'll get over it. But, you know, it was just, so why do we judge from the outside? It's like when um, God sent Samuel to anoint one of Jesse's sons. 
to be the next king. And Jesse lines up the big strapping boys and, and, and Samuel, each one, oh, God, this must be it. And God kept saying, not him, not him. And then he gets to the end of them, and there's no more. And he's like, well, don't you have any more? Oh, yeah, yeah, David, he's out, he's, he's out with the sheep. Bring him in. So, and God said, God said to Samuel, he said, you judge, you judge the outside. You judge with your eyes. I can see into their hearts. See, and that's, that's what matters. What matters, what Jesus sees us, and he sees into our hearts. And what's he, what does he want to see? He wants to see faith. He wants to see faith in him. And if he sees faith in him, he gives us the most wonderful gift. Um, another story, I'm loading up on stories on you guys today, but I go to uh, the salt room, which is only like two blocks down Mills, um, for my allergies. You sit in a, it's like a spa. You sit in a room uh, in these beach chairs, and they dim the lights, and, and, and they have this uh, machine, hollow generator that blows salt into the room. And so it's really, really helped me with my allergies. The pollen is terrible right now, so it's a, it's a hard time for me. And that helps me. It helps uh, keep all that clean. It's organic, and I don't get the sinus infections and stuff. It's a great place. And um, I was, the, the owner was up front one day, and, and she's like, how long have you been coming here? And she's like, well, I can look it up. It was funny. The day we looked was one day past my four-year anniversary of going there. And she said, well, I'm going to, you know, to celebrate, I'm going to give you a, a free service. And they have other services like massages. Uh, and, they, and then they have acupuncture. And, um, and they have facials. And so, and they're fourteen ninety. dollars no. And so, um, I've, because I've been going, I've gotten to know the, the people that work there, the, the front desk and and there's been this one who, who I've known the whole time. She's been there the whole time, very kind person. And she, um, she was going through acupuncture school, and so she worked at the front desk. And now she's become an acupuncturist, so now she's in the back. And uh, she's, um, parents are from India, but uh, she, she grew up here. And anyway, she, I've just gotten to know her over the years. And so I said... You know, for my free service, I've never gotten acupuncture. I, I've, I've always been curious, you know, and I want to, you know, Sima. I haven't done any, I haven't done Sima's acupuncture yet, so I need to work with her. I want to do something with her, so I'll take that for my free one. So, anyway, she gives me all this stuff to fill out about my health, and fortunately there uh, isn't much to fill out there um, at this point, anyway. And... Um, so she gets me in the, the room and she said, well, what are we working on? You have some seasonal allergies. You're going to the salt room and taking care of it. What's, you know, what are we really working on? I need, you got to give me something to work on. And so she started drilling me with questions. And she um, exposed that I have a disease. It's called stress. I don't know if you've ever heard of it or you've ever experienced it yourself. I, I think it might be contagious. Um, and so, and then what she said to me was, and she knows I'm a pastor, she said, well, isn't Christianity about forgiveness? And I was healed from that moment on. I mean, not that I've, I'll never, but my healing was given to me with those words. And then I laid on the table and she put needles into me and it was nice, and, but that... <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Um, but what she said to me, I, I, was he I, I felt a healing. Isn't Christianity about forgiveness? It's all she had to say to me to heal me that day. I told her, told her that later, and she said, I love that because what I'm trying to do is draw out you, and that's who you are, and that's what you know about. And, um, and so she drew that out of me. And anyway, if we have, God sees our heart, and if we have faith, if he sees faith in that heart, he is willing to give us the most amazing healing gift. It's forgiveness.